and welcome to episode 114 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is October 14th and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. So this was quite a busy week. Um, together with a few other colleagues, um, Martin and I attended the DSAC Jahreskongress in Leipzig, where we had some great discussions with SAP, with customers, with DSAC, with partners. In parallel, there is Microsoft Ignite, so we have tons of news. Since this would take a very long time, we will keep it short, at least in, in this episode, and we will actually have a quick view live on site with Robert. Um, but then obviously we have another very important topic that we want to cover um, today. Um, as you can see, Martin also brought Will, Will Eastbury with him. So you know it will be a really fantastic show. Martin and Will will talk um, about some a really cool project that they have been working on that basically enables you to use Azure Functions to connect um, to your to your SAP system in a, in a really nice way. But um, yeah, as, as mentioned before we go there, um, let me quickly start with one slide um, and or one one web page, and that's the Ignite big of a uh, book of news. So the big book of news, as the last few times that we talked about this, um, covers everything or, or the, the most important things that we um, have announced or that we are announcing um, during um, Ignite. But actually, since we have the fantastic opportunity to have Robert on site um, at Ignite in Munich. Maybe let's let's get a quick live view from him, and then we'll we'll come back to to some more news here. So Robert, can you quickly? Uh, well, actually, let me sh unshare, stop my sharing, so that we can see you full screen. And now over to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Olga. So it's a little bit maybe noisy, but I will. Okay. Uh, I will switch my cameras because I think it's much more interesting to see what is happening around me. So just a second. Why settings and how to find another camera? Okay, this camera. And I will actually start with very important part of Microsoft Ignite is gaming zone. Yeah, so where we can play flight simulator and some very, very old games. Yeah, like you know. Pac-Man and this is Spice Invaders and we have a pinballs and so on. I mean, uh, Microsoft Ignite Munich, unfortunately, I'm not in US, I'm in, in Munich, so the full, uh, the big conference is always in US. So this is our German version of, okay, let's let's show the nice Munich building and offices. Oh, nice so it's team. actually, uh, it's, uh, there's a live stream, so most recorded and uh, live streamed and uh, we start yesterday today also we have a full program in most cases what we are doing is a combination of new stuff which are coming in redmond and somehow trying to analyze them together with our partner and customers customers and partners are actually presenting how they are facing how they're solving issues with digitalization, security, and all those important topics. There was an interesting session yesterday, for example, how Lufthansa used uh, Microsoft Purview, how they uh, self using the Power Platform to solve some business uh, process issues. There's a lot of interesting sessions. They are, most of them are live or recorded in uh, mm -hmm. German, not in English, unfortunately. And uh, I mean, it's very interesting. And, and, and as I mentioned, it's somehow always combined with something what is happening in Redmond. So we always have live streams from Redmond. So this is a somehow new format. What Mike, uh, Microsoft is trying to do, not just to have a focus on uh, Ignite in one, in one country, like in US, like traditionally always in US, but now we have also some across different countries. And currently I'm in, in the Microsoft building here in Munich, where we have the Microsoft Niger. So, and probably you, you already mentioned, you'll discuss about all those new stuff that is coming because there's a huge list of new stuff which is coming from really from, from, from office perspective, for new devices perspective, and also what is also important for our session, uh, for our uh, SAP and Azure podcast, there's a very nice news around SAP and Azure. So that's all from my side and then Back to studio. <laughs> <laughs> you always wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my dream. <laughs> okay. So, 
Cool. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. And I think that it's, it's really great. And as you said, um, uh, uh, Ignite is really a hybrid event. I mean, there is um, there is the big on-site um, event in, in Seattle. Then there's obviously this huge event um, live virtually, but then all across the world, there are a few places where there are um, other on-site hubs or whatever you might call them. I'm not sure actually, like, like the one in, in Munich right now. So let me actually switch back to my um to to this book of news um because um as you said so so here there there are 200,000 people um attending virtually um 7,500 attending um on site in 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 uh in in different and places and as you said as as you mentioned um SAP is a big topic and actually what I did is if you search here in the book of news for SAP you can see, and, and remember, this is the Microsoft Ignite book of news. Um, you, you can see there, there are a lot of references um, for SAP there as well. And the list of topics is really long. Um, yesterday, I went through the book of news and I, I marked so many things. But in the end, I said, well, this 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 is probably a, an own episode um, for itself. So I said, well, well, let's just skip this. And now what I want to do before we hand over then to, to Martin and Will is just ease a few um, topics and I do want to start with SAP actually because we had a fairly big announcement um, at Ignite um, on the collaboration work that we are doing with um, SAP here. So with S4 HANA, or, um, SAP S4 HANA Cloud, we were working on an integration with teams based on um, adaptive card based loop components. And uh, there, there's some announcement on, on our side, on the SAP side. The easiest way to get started is there's a video from um, or the video snippet from from Satya Nadella in his keynote where he quickly talks about and actually let me let me play this on on mute maybe in in the background where he talks about uh, the the integration. Not sure why this is not in full quality here, but again all the links are in the show note. But here he he shows um, in a, in a short way how we have worked with SAP on this integration. Um, of SAP data into Teams, in Outlook, um, in, in, in other U UIs based on the on these um, loop components. So I think that is definitely something um, that you should check out. Um, moving on ag again in a very fast-paced manner, and all the links are in the show notes, so you can definitely um, take a look at them um, later on. We now also um, certified or released the certified close to 24 terabyte memory virtual machines. And so if you read through this, um, you can see um, obviously, and uh, we have teased and, and talked to some extent about this also on the on the podcast a few times already. We have several customers where this is really already um, running in production. So we, where we obviously worked very closely with SAP um, to support these large cu customers even before the virtual machines were officially certified. Now they are certified. So if you go to the um, um, SAP certified supported HANA hardware directory, you can see these um, M832IXS V2. Um, so really yeah, almost 24 terabyte virtual machines that are now um, supported for SAP workload. So I think that's that's really something where we seek, where, where we have customers that, that are really um, depending on such very large virtual machines with a huge memory footprint. So um, fresh from the press, the, these are now um, also certified and available for, for everyone basically to consume. Then um, there are additional informations on the Azure Center for SAP Solutions. So remember the, the show that we had a few weeks back with Aaron Stern, um, where he where we introduced, where we talked about the ACSS, the Azure Center for, the, for SAP Solution for the first time. And you can see th there are constantly new things um, um, happening there. So now, um, um, we, we support um, Windows space, so the registration of Windows based system. And I'm just thinking, well, it doesn't make sense to go over all these, these things. This will take too much time because, again, ACSS is something where I see a huge potential. This, this is really a game changer for, for SAP on, on Azure. So just take a look. There are lots of fantastic um, new announcements, and you can really see constant innovation um, happening here on the ACSS front. And moving on, still staying on the um, SAP and Microsoft integration side, um, we had talked about this, I think, last week um, that Bartosz, um had created a blog post on the new CDC connector that allows you to uh, 
connect information or retrieve information from the ODP, the Operational Data Provisioning um, Framework on the SAP side and get the data into Azure Data Factory. Um, now the blog post is live again, I would say, um, on the um, tech community. So um, you have a nice um, uh, how-to guide almost um, to get started, how to use um, the, the um, connectivity. So I think this is, this is a really great starting point. And actually, just today, or no, um, oh, wait, I forgot the link. Sorry, I forgot the link um, to add the link because the CDC connector is now GA. So um, during Ignite, um, we announced that the CDC connector is now generally available. So it's no longer in public preview, as is mentioned here in Bartra's blog post. But this is now really something um, that you can also use in, in GA. Um, Moving on, something um, where actually I think Martin, you should talk about this because this is all your work, and and it's I think it's always fantastic if um, a blog post or an idea does not only end up in a, in a blog post, but it's really part of the official um, documentation. And um, here on learn.microsoft.com, so the, the previous docs, um, Microsoft.com, uh, we have now an article from Martin um, that talks about principle propagation in Power Query to, to an OData service. So, so you might remember we, we talked, we, we showed you in the past how you can use, um, how you can connect to an OData service from Excel. There, there's nothing that you need to develop there. It's it's just out of the box functionalities. But um, there, there are ways how you can do the authentication, but typically we just show the username and password um, a way to authenticate against the, um, the um, OData service. Now with this one, with the, with the work that Martin did, um, yeah, we, we can now show you how to use <clears throat> really single sign-on, so the principle of propagation flow from um, Power Query um, to an um, OData feed that is also yeah enabled for, for authentication. Uh, we'll at least deserve as much credit since it's based on the very first things that we did um, on API management to do really this, this mapping and uh, this pattern um, like enables us in many different ways, yeah? even uh, today, yeah? there, there are aspects of it. Uh, so this was a really uh, good foundation. Yeah? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, for example, if I look at Martin Pankratz, uh, sorry, sorry, Martin Repple, um, he has also done a lot of preparation, but I still think you're the you're you're the owner here um, of this topic. So I think I, I definitely want to give credit to you, especially since you're on the show. Next yeah, week, we'll, I will diss you completely, but for, for this week. Uh, thank you then. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll uh, uh, had the fun with it, doing it with me. I get the blame afterwards if something goes <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Perfect. So, so um, only three more things and then we're done. Um, a part of the DSAC Jahres Congress, um, DSAC also um, released their results of their yearly survey. So, so every year they they uh, do a survey. They they ask um, customers, and this time I think it was for the first time that they did it together with ASAC and also um, JSAC, the Japanese um, SAP user group. Um, and they asked a lot of here: Are you keeping up with the change? Um, the feedback there um, from 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 customers, um, um, IT barriers and stuff like that. And and. and this is now also available in, in English, which I think is, is also nice. And for, for us, again, from an SAP and Microsoft perspective, obviously there was also one interesting um, question that was, um, let me quickly uh, find the right wording. When these are, were asked which software providers were the most important to them um, in this respect, and then SAP was first. And I think that's obviously, I mean, we are, uh, this, is, this question is coming from an SAP, community. So I think uh, that's very clear that SAP is first. But then the great thing was Microsoft was already second. So I think also this shows how important our podcast is, um, because this really addresses a lot of customers that are using SAP and Microsoft, because a lot of customers are just um, focusing on, on these technologies that or, or providers. That does not mean that they're also using Oracle, Salesforce, AWS, and, and Google. But but I think it's, it's great to see that um, Microsoft and SAP are um, the, the front runners um, in these scenarios. There is also a PDF attached with a little more details. Um, so yeah, just check this out. Then um, a little going into this direction of um, 
um, the Teams integration that I started with. I almost want to end with this because there's also a lot of new things and when it comes to the Teams integration. And what I personally liked um, a lot are all these infusion of AI technologies. So um, there, there's now um, um, a feature called Intelligence Recap, where you get apparently um, a summary of the meeting, where you can get um, uh, action items assigned to you or, or hopefully to others for these, where you have uh, live transactions, uh, live translations for captions. So I think it's for me, it was really, really great to see that a lot of AI functionalities are now um, infused also in, in Teams. And let's see how, how it works. I mean, I've not, not seen it myself, obviously, but um, this, this looks really, really interesting from my point of view. And the last thing I want to close my uh, my uh, recap of the news is the Power Platform. There are some amazing things that were announced in the Power Platform. And again, I only want to focus on, on one specific topic, and that is the um, AI infusion. What I personally liked, and I, I had talked about this in, in the past, um, where um, you could write, um, sort this table by first name descending, and then um, Power Automate or Power Apps would generate the the respond um, the, the required code for this and i think this is really something crucial because with the power platform we are addressing a business user not necessarily the hardcore developer who knows regex expressions inside out but really the, the casual user and if you, if we can help these users by um expressing something in natural language and then translating this i think that's a huge win and now we are taking this basically to the next level so um with open ai codex or actually um, GitHub co or the same technology that is also used with GitHub Copilot, we now also are, are previewing um, a functionality um, that allows you to describe a certain flow, and then we generate the flow out of this. So um, every time someone responds to a Microsoft form survey, post a message to Teams and send an email. This is what you describe, and then um, using OpenAI um, um, Codex will generate the flow out of this and don't get me wrong I, i'm sure this this will first only work for very very easy flows but i think the potential here is really amazing and, and think of the millions of millions of power platform users that are going to use this where we can really train um, the models and, and and improve the quality so so there are lots of other ai related things but but i thought this was really a nice um um thing where i think it just shows the power of the power platform and and the roadmap where, where we're going. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear some some really cool things um, from this later on. So the list that we could talk about Ignite is much, much longer, but in order not to waste any more time, let me actually um, finally hand over to Martin and Will. I guess almost everyone knows you, but still maybe you can do a quick introduction of yourself so that everyone knows who you are. And then I'm looking forward to the presentation and demo that you have created. Will is first. <laughs> yes, so Will Eastbury, one of the fast track for Azure um, engineers out of EMEA focusing on SAP app modernization. But your manager now, Will, yeah? I am at the moment, yeah, in a, in a transition state between manager and, and player manager. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And Martin. Nice. Yeah, Martin Pankras. I'm a team member of the same team where Holger is, and um, we're looking at the SAP integration experience across the whole portfolio. And that involves all the interfaces, um, like we saw today, the Power Query part, for instance, the latest ones that we did. And, and now you I, bring the integration experience to a whole new level. Well, at least we, we strive to, yeah. And um, the, the latest screenshot that you showed, uh, that really got me inspired where we can then start putting sentences. Now post a, when every time a purchase order is posted to SAP, um, send me a notification and stuff like that. Yeah, So we'll probably see some of these further down the line. But Martin, I actually think that's that's exactly what I thought. And especially if you put this all, to, all in, into context, I mean, a few weeks ago in the Power Platform Conference, um, John Gilman and um, the team announced the new ERP connector with additional templates for order to cash um, so, so so a lot of business scenarios i actually think this this can really come together in a beautiful way that you not only get a notification as if someone creates a forms entry 
but exactly like you said, that we can really infuse here the SAP technology. And both of us will, will definitely have lots of discussions with the Power Platform team to make sure that something like this will happen. Very nice. So then we'll move into uh, the materials that we want to show today. So we want to start where we left off last time. So PowerPoint yep. Live. Yep, I can see it. Okay. So we found a nice template yeah, that, that we're going to use for this today. Oh, <laughs> and like I, I said, have some digital DNA strands in your template. So actually, um, during DSAC, I had several discussions actually that talked um, to me about the, the podcast and a lot of them are also only listening to the podcast. So they are using the audio only. So if you had just listening to this podcast now, you're missing this beautiful PowerPoint um, template. So you should definitely quickly look at the YouTube video as well. I think we're getting a, a small echo from, from Will's audio. Yeah, my, old, my screen appears to have locked up. All right, then we'll mute Will until he recovers, and um, I, I progressed in the in the slide deck. So, like I said before, we uh, want to like um, continue where we left off during one of the the former sessions when we talked about API management integrations and um, also Open API and how to work with SAP or data services there. So we put together um, a small introduction here to give the context again. And then we'll go into the live demo with the functions. So app modernization is like a um, strategic topic um, with, within Microsoft, where um, we help customers on their journey to really um, become cloud native for, for their app developments as well. And one aspect of that is um, also SAP integration. Yeah? So that's it's like a natural fit that happens when you move into, into your cloud journey. And one of the, the challenges that we addressed first um, were the authentication parts. Yeah? So you see here, top left, there's an illustration of the uh, OAuth uh, flows that you might might challenge yeah? um, with on behalf of to make sure that you have Azure AD users somehow mapped to the SAP named users, yeah? which has license implications, which has um, governance risk control implications. Do I still have the same authorizations that are meticulously maintained in the back end, which is also audited, yeah, where I'm really sure that everything is correct to make sure I can reuse it. Yeah. But how does this impact now my, my whole web, my application design? How can I make sure that all of this is um, honored? Yeah. And um, parts of that was then engaging the open API community. You see here on the top right, there's Ralf Handel from, from SAP, one of the um, chair members of the, uh, the um, OASIS organization, where uh, Microsoft and SAP and others uh, make sure we have um, open source driven um, standardized process for, for our data. And this includes also the conversion to, to open API. So we had quite some uh, work on the um, converters there and the generators to make sure um, we have a, um, a a nice set of of software um, to to get into this space, and then here um, to also showcase the types of configurations you face in the cloud connector ecosystem. There's settings for on-premises, trust stores, all of these things, and um, how how much or how important it becomes, or what kind of accelerator it becomes when you can box this in one place to solve it for all the developers. Yeah, so that you don't do this on an app by app basis, but really have it boxed in one place and everyone can profit from it. Okay. Some of the topics are already um, teased here. So those are the things that we uh, faced most in customer conversations and also uh, tackled in, in, our, in our work. I mentioned already the on behalf of flows, so the OR2, some of the BRA assertions. Yeah. 
and um, CSRF tokens became very quickly a topic when you're not only reading, but you're also posting. Yeah? So you're sending updates. So at that point, this uh, blows up on your end. And um, th those aspects here are already quite the accelerator. Yeah? If you get the authentication authorizations reused, do it with Azure AD, get the tokens at the right time when you need them, ask the SAP gateway for the token to make the change. And then uh, really governance topics where the IT departments are saying, well, it's nice that you're using Power Apps, you're using app services, functions, but how do we make sure that um, the next thing that happens when you do this on a large scale, uh, you don't get our financial closing uh, threatened yeah, by the requests? And I had Will raising his hand to to, to add a comment. Just to let you know that I'm connected again, really. <laughs> you are alive again, yeah. I am, yeah. My machine overheated. Yeah. Um, do you want to continue with the, the middle and right part on, on here? I, I'm, I'm quite happy to. I'm also quite happy you're doing, doing a great job, to be honest. Um, th the key theme that we've seen through here as we've as we've worked through with customers and actually, in all honesty, as we've been producing the blog, uh, the, the series, is there are lots of things that are going on here which are all cross-cutting and every customer needs to do them and every customer finds them actually, frankly, a challenge. And they're all repeatable. So we, we can attack them all together as a group and solve them for everyone, which is where we've been trying to go with mapping policies and with what we're going to demonstrate to you later on. But the, you know, the idea is here, if we can just go on to the, the bottom frame, is that you're, if you're developing anything really, whether it's SAP or whether it's something else, you don't want, you just want to get on and build your app. Yeah, you don't, you don't want the hassle of figuring out whether to connect with Oboe or whether you need to go and use some other flow for OAuth or why you have to have a CSRF token when you're not building a, a client facing web application connected to SAP if it's server side or why you need to be worrying about throttling or actually the, the intricacies of the OData protocol or session management or what, what the differences are between OData and open API in terms of what you push through or how to cache. You just want to get on and be able to build your application in the most streamlined and fastest way possible. And then for the business owners and business space, that results in a cheaper application because there's less time overhead spent, there's less man hours or, or person hours burned um, in order to get to the minimum viable product of the application as soon as they can. Exactly, yeah. And Holger is muted, talking on his own webcast. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> No, I, I just wanted to, that was something that I found extremely interesting. So when both of you started with the API management, um, for me, the initial starting point was very clear um, because I came from the API management world at SAP and throttling is something that is really important. So for me, when we were talking about, um, I don't know, a power platform connecting via OData to an SAP system, I knew that throttling would be an important piece. But then when, when I saw that, that when you interacted with the first customers and then um, all of a sudden, I think, you had the idea of introducing caching, or I think that was actually coming from, from Microsoft IT or something like that, where they were saying, well, look, we, we have these spikes in the morning when all of a sudden thousands of, of users are logging in and where I think you, I don't know, Martin or, or Will, where you then introduced also this um, uh, randomness of um, how long do we, we keep the cache because so that not everyone at the same time refreshes. I think there was such really, really cool things that you fixed in one central place instead of each and every developer oh how do i need to do this how do i figure this just having this api policy that takes care of all of this and, and as you said developers i i just want, need to read this now for the audio 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 <laughs> only piece app developers just want to have fun and build the apps well and have fun yeah but, but that that's exactly what you're doing and that's what i found so fascinating that what started as a very simple API policy that just handled or data or that just handled authentication all of a sudden became this this really really powerful piece that takes a lot of annoying work for me as a developer I can as you said I can now really focus on building the application not building or looking at this stupid plumbing which again each and every developer needs to do yeah, There's even a term uh, that I think Robert Biro introduced me to it from the SAP basis days when it said it's Monday morning blues. Yeah, it just happens to the systems after the weekend. And um, this random delay, like you mentioned, yeah, 
that was one of the suggestions that uh, that will made um which was really simple to do um, it really gets you off that 9 a.m blocker on monday morning which chokes the sap oout server and no one can do anything anymore yeah, until people go get coffee again yeah. <laughs> It's probably worth mentioning at this point, we did still learn from what we showed uh, the last time when we did a demonstration at Integrate 2022. Uh, we did a Twitter a sticker feed and then probably still managed to kill it um, because we did a, a live feed in, in the room. Um, so you still need That's to tune those parameters to get to the use case that you need. Um, it's not absolutely, you know, 100% bulletproof, but it does give you a significant improvement in terms of the, the mm. loads. But it, we killed it in London, Will, because we didn't add throttling. We had every we had everyone <laughs> putting updates, but then it just went away. No? Yeah. All right. So the next one, Will, uh, want, uh, became philosophical and um, <laughs> wanted to set the stage, yeah, for for the next part of it. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, the purpose of me putting this slide in here was that we realised how far we were away from making this easy. Um, and the app in policy went a long way to taking a lot of the infrastructure background away. But in honesty, it's still a challenge, right, to, to do the conversions from um, the tooling that we had. We even struggled to get some of the tooling working ourselves when we sat down and tried to pull some of this off for a demonstration. So we realized we had to fix that uh, as a priority, um, which we, we showed you in the last podcast. But each step in here we're going to show you builds on the last one. So the most important step was really the first one, which was pulling out the the open API um, from O data uh, uh, conversions and generation, because that was actually quite hard to do. And wrapping it in a box, um, publishing the samples, looking through the work that had already been done on principal propagation and building on that. Um, and the last stage we I think we spoke to you about last time was where we ended up with our our Kyoto built. Um, downloadable SDK. Mm -hmm. So on the left hand side here, we've got what was published as Power Platform. Yeah, so go grab an open API definition, shove the policy in with AppIM, and that lights up the majority of connectivity for you for doing a citizen developer or, or like IT pro type development with no code or low code in Power Platform. And that's how that kind of piece is working. But my, my background personally is an application developer. Uh, with it with SAP or otherwise and I want to be able to have my life simplified so I can write better and easier and cleaner code. Yeah, I want a couple of le more levels of abstraction and we ran the Kyoto SDK and it looks very nice in terms of what you get outputted. It's still not quite the uh, the last mile and it's not a fault of Kyoto. What Kyoto is designed to do is to take an open API definition and generate you an SDK, as you would expect, with a series of rules. So it's based really on the graph platform. Uh, and for that, it works brilliantly. For Shall we look at purposes, an example there, Will? Shall yeah, we? Yeah, yeah so, go for it. So the, let me share the screen for that instead. So this, this is where we left off, right? So we have the two tabs here where for the the, the normal conversion where you get the open API definition as XML, but we also have the SDK generator introduced. Yeah? And here's the gate W sample basic that they were using. And from here, you then get to choose between the languages that the Kyoto SDK supports. Yeah? And um, from there, you can then create the download. And I did that a second ago. You still see the, the zip file here. And then you get something like this. And then he, in here, I engaged with Will a couple of weeks back, said, well, how do I get this plug and play? Yeah, so I, I get a lot of code and I get all the objects and there's some marshalling and um, a wrapper file. Um, but still, um, it, it feels like quite some overhead. No? You yeah. want to uh, talk about some specifics here, Well, Yeah, there's, there's just one key thing, really, right? What you get here is not an SAP native like mm -hmm. comprehending service. Yeah, you get an a wrapper around an open an O data service passed through an open API gateway. So you do get a typed object. You can see sales order set, for example. In fact, just to drill into the product we're going to do later on, can we just take a look at product set? Um yep. So So you there. see product set and then you should see product set with product ID. 
So collection of products, good for me. This yeah. One. And look how complex this actually is in the background. So we've got a collection of products, and this is just a, it's just a record set, right? Um, and you can see all of the different values and random codes that have been interspersed inside here. The, the model references, the different levels of complexity that we've got in here, and it's all exposed to you, right? Now, I don't necessarily as a developer care about any of that. I want to see this in a box. I want to call an API that says, get me a product, get me a list of products and filter it. Yeah, update a product and write it back. Give me things that relate to a product. And that's all embedded in the OData definition. Yeah, and it's some of it comes out in the open API conversion. So you can see, for example, product set with product ID. But what we can't see in here, really, if we have a look at the sales order line, it should show us. The sales order set should have relationships to other other things, and sales order should have relationships to products and customers, and they should yeah. be relations to partners, etc. That kind of gets masked when we in the logic when we do the conversion from OData to Open API. It is in there; it's buried in annotations, and the generation tools for Open API three don't really do it justice. Yeah. So what we felt was we needed to keep the uh, the tooling to allow us to pass traffic through Appin as the Open API definition. So all of the valid URLs and filter URLs and everything else that we generate will be there. Yeah. But generate the SDK off the back of the OData definition, not off the back of the Open API definition. Um, that's important because I'll show you a little bit later on where, where what that lights up in terms of the demo. Yeah, but you can understand that if you try and use this now, there's some additional stuff you need to box in around auth. And mm -hmm. there's it's just it's not a leaky abstraction. The abstraction's OK and the Coyote team do a great job, but it's not as easy to work with as we really want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And so, if also to your mm -hmm. AI point, Olga, if we have a metadata definition located in here, which is reasonably documented and commented, Copilot can read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, true. Mm -hmm. Which we'll come to in a moment. So when we've been building some of this, obviously we have some some uh, some internal things around Copilot, but Copilot is capable of reading the definition of what we're going to demo next. I've never actually tried to do a live demo of Copilot doing SAP integration, but what the hell? Let's see what happens. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think we had like uh, two two more slides before the demo, so I'm getting it quickly back. So Will feels like uh, lucky today, huh? trying new things online. No me, I'm just I'm just not scared of failure. I think is the bit. <laughs> <laughs> so here here's again the evolution. Yeah, like we already introduced today verbally, where we started with the Open API generator put it into the API management policy yeah, to reuse it. And then uh, we were enriching parts that were important to Power Platform yeah, to really get the open the OData semantics also into Open API, which was required. And then um, put it also onto the logic apps for the for the exporting. Yeah? And you had all the blog posts that were supporting this and the other webcasts that we did with you. And there we stopped at the Kyoto part that we looked at last uh, with the Go code. And then we have and more steps. Blank steps, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Yeah. So there are more. There were further steps to go at this point, right? But we haven't told you about those yet. Um, we've hinted at them, if I'm honest. So I think we've got a we are here bracket there. Um, that's where we got to last time. And there we go next. Yeah, let's go slides. Okay, this is what we really want. So this is the developer centric perspective. Yeah, ideally we want a native SDK. Yeah, that we can generate that doesn't handle the leaking abstraction of open API over the top of our OData service. Um, and we can embed that into our application. That is what we were hoping for from Kyoto originally, but it just it isn't designed to do what we wanted to do. It does it get close. Um, 
what we want is an experience that's a little bit more like an OData connected service from Visual Studio or something of that ilk. Um, which, which actively is something you can do if you're using um, Net Framework, and it will actually work, and you can wrap that the object that it generates up if you're in if you're in Net Framework. I'm not seeing it for Net Core yet though. Um, and then that enables us to add another abstraction over the top. Yeah, so when we've got a direct OData build based off the metadata, we can then start, if we want to, to wrap that in other things. Yeah, and that's how we can start to build platform connectors and other additional features. So one of the things we thought would be really, it started out as a wouldn't this be cool moment? Yeah, like a blue sky thinking moment. And then we actually thought about it in a bit more depth and it was, do you know what, actually it wouldn't just be cool, it would really light up the ecosystem in terms of what we can allow people to do and build and make it easier for people. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the amount of code that you're going to have to be writing and wrapping to develop applications against these SAP backend services, in theory against any OData service, to be honest, this will work for, but it is specifically tuned for SAP services. Um, we'll be getting less and less as we drop and release these these items. So that's where we want to be. Yeah, it's a native SDK that you can wrap in your app, or we can wrap it in a function binding and run it from Azure Functions. Be that wherever you want to run the function, whether it's in the Azure Function service or on uh, Kubernetes or in containers or whatever, um, that you can then run an app inside it and then connect to it from something else. So it could even be an on-premises solution, yeah, because yep. you develop it with the cloud native means, you deploy it in your mm -hmm. data center and your landscape, profit yep. from the, the features, and you're already ready to move because yep. it's the same right. environment, same code that also runs on Azure. Absolutely. So if I'm running in the developer environment, which I will be in the demo later on, yeah, obviously I'm on premise on my at my house here at the moment, yeah, but uh, we won't be showing it running in the Azure Function service just yet. It does run in that, but we won't be showing it that way mm -hmm. today. Um, so you can run it wherever you like. In particular, with the connectivity for Arc that we've talked about on previous um, yep. previous episodes, and um, Arc for Kubernetes and the AppIM self-hosted gateway services. Yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't put a function app with a binding or an app with a native SDK on premise and have it exposed only to internal users. This stuff isn't just about the internet and it is it is supposed to be Azure enabling, but we are not ruling out running services elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to move into the next slides or should we go yeah. into the code on your end already? Let's, ju let's jump to the next slide. Okay. The... There we go. .NET Core. Indeed. So what would happen if we could connect, retrieve it automatically, update it and write it straight back? Yeah, now if you think about how many lines of code it would typically take to establish a connection to an SAP server, retrieve the metadata around a sales order, populate the table that you need to send back to a sales order, execute it, then go and retrieve and traverse the relationship to a business partner from the customer, Retrieve the address, grab the city, output it to the console, and then update and write back the price of an order. That would usually be a lot of code. Yeah, in terms of what we've got here, we have an automatic binding on the input line. So you see, see the first piece. Yep. So we're bound to an IED piece. This is fairly technical so for people who are a bit more business oriented on the call. I'll make this reasonably brief. Um, but basically, a web server is running here. We're hitting a URL with sales order price update with a sales order ID and a price. That's being fed into the input binding, which automatically goes and retrieves the order for us. Yet we also then have an output binding, which is just a list of sales orders we can add to, and it writes away for us. And then we're just connecting the two further down. But we, because we're now at the OData level, not at the open API level, we understand and can see the delayed input semantics. So when we've got references in OData that are coming back from SAP, there is a concept in OData called a deferred um, record. So we don't instantly load the business partner data, part, partner data, yeah? So we can now say where this is deferred, give me another get async method. And we can mm -hmm. asynchronously go away and load the business partner data in the background 
if it's required. Yeah, if it's not required, you'll never load it. So you get lazy loading. And that's the kind of thing that we're now able to enable by looking at the OData semantics and having a slightly customized SDK client based off of metadata. Mm -hmm. Or type business objects. So you can see here we've got a business partner which has an address property, which has a city, because these are complex objects and they're all nested. Those are all generated for you as well. Yeah, we can show those a little bit later on. That you actually do get from Kyoto as well. They're all generated and you could use the Kyoto objects from Go if you wanted to, to connect to this function binding. Because one nice feature about function bindings is they allow you to use pretty much any language that the binding supports, but use the C-sharp SDK, SDK uh, components. So you could combine the two together and write a function in Go with typed objects. Mm -hmm. I would add we haven't tried that. If anybody is interested in trying to do that, we'd love to hear from you um, and, and, uh, and support you while you try and do it, actually. Uh, but we haven't actually tried to do that yet. OK, should we take a look at the next slide? So that's all very well and good. We've demonstrated a static input, so give me a sales order and a static output. Add, add an update to this sales order or change it and write it back. But OData is about a lot more than just that. So what about if we can expose the query semantics as well? Yeah, so I don't want as a developer to be writing complex filter clauses or complex um, order by clauses or top clauses. I want all that to be built for me. So there's a ton of factory methods in this SDK, which you can expose whatever level you like, which will help you build those complex clauses. Um, it, it's one of my top bugbears when I'm working with OData is how do I express this filter clause? Mm -hmm. Do I need quotes around this? Do I need to have percent embedding and encoding in here? What does my equals or greater than piece look like? And I've always got a reference manual open for me. You know, I've always got the spec open somewhere. Well, oh, this is an EQ or is this equals? Yes. What is yeah. this starts with, with a capital W or a lowercase W? And all this is just gone, this scenario here. So what you can see on screen here, and I, and I will actually demonstrate this particular component later on, but you can see here this time, if you look at the auto loading the product set so we're able to bind to a set and use that set inside of my function um, we have a product set attribute and that simply refers to a lazy loaded list of products from sap yeah you can do what you like with it if you bind to the set if you bind to a product you'll get an instance of the product if i bind to the set i get a query engine which i can execute queries against yeah, and in this case, I'm just saying, give me the top X mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. products, yeah, which are bound in the product URL. So if you look at the root at the top, you can see products top. Um, and that's to the right there. On the top line of the function, there is root equals product slash top, which is being bound out if you look to an integer parameter to the right in the top. Yeah, and then we can use that later on in our top factory to build out the top factory clause. So that that execution of that should return the top n of any products ordered by product id where the product id starts with ht and in our demo system i think they all do but but um yeah it could be run in any against any concept we could be looking at sales orders or customers or whatever and it'd be exactly the same concept so we could in theory express up I've, I've put some carriage returns in here so it looks nice but that's one line of code <laughs> yeah. Indeed, and but remember this this could be the... in, but it really is one line, and we're using the binding frameworks to do the, the heavy lifting for us, and we're using the SDK generation to make it really simple. Quick comment okay. there: keep in, keep in mind this is Azure Functions, yeah. So this is yeah. cloud native. This can be serverless. Yeah, you only use it when you need it, and this is the the enabler for, to to combine any platforms to service component within Azure next. And it could be app services consuming this. You're taking away the the, the, the logic from, from the front-end developers. Yeah, so you, this is really where you want to go with your cloud native app development with exactly. only one line of code to produce the, um, the output here for the product. I'm now wishing I had another slide in here, which is what if Copilot could? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, nice um, episode. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll we'll try and shoot on a little bit in here today and see if it see if it crashes and burns on me. But but um, this stuff, I, yeah, it really is quite quite elegant to see in practice. So. Over to you okay. to the to the English on premises then, yeah, into your house. <laughs> Uh, Will, Will, one question. You yeah. mentioned this. I mean, uh, you have this product set, sales order. You mentioned this that that you create the model, so you have all those classes created in yeah. framework. So, what is inside? How far you want to go with all those models? What you currently have from that model so, perspective? So the stand stand that we have now, and I can quickly show you this when we come to the demo. So I'll I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, okay. I'll skim over it for now, but I'll I'll show it in a bit more depth later. What we basically have is a generation engine that, that establishes and loads the um, OData uh, model internally. So mm -hmm. we're then able to pass through that model and look at the annotations and look at the relationships and generate a series of static classes. Okay. Yeah, so we're generating a product class from mm -hmm. that. If there's a relationship in an entity set inside there, we generate a product set. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we're, if it's a sales order, we'll get a sales order and a sales order set. We're also able then to look through each of those stages and generate any relationships, which is what generates the, the dot notation you saw earlier on for the lazy loading. So where there's a, I shouldn't call it a foreign key because that's relational database terminology and it's not relational databases, it's application. But effectively, if there's a remote key, for mm -hmm. example, to a business partner ID, we'll map it. So you can go and get okay. business partner and then there are annotations on that which refer to the parent and child keys which will automatically map in. So for a sales order, you'll have a customer ID and it'll map to business partner. Mm -hmm. For a um, purchase order, it would be a supplier ID, but it's still a business partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those relationships are inferred automatically for you, so you don't have to care about them. Um, and I think that's one of the abstractions that's useful for a developer. Because if you're, you know, if you're a business functional or a business analyst, you'll know those. Yeah, mm. you'll know when you're working in SAP that if you go into the data dictionary, this this maps to this logically. And actually, a lot of people yeah. working in them will also know a four character field name for exactly what they are, you know, and exactly which table they are in Germany, regardless of which language you natively speak. So. A lot of people will know that, but an external developer coming from C Sharp will not know that. No. They, they won't have a clue about the mappings of the metadata behind the scenes. So that's what the, the OData exposes really, really nicely and cleanly. What we don't necessarily have at the moment is every single piece of OData functionality implemented in this client. Yeah, there is very basic premises of so filtering, sorting. Um, we're about three quarters of the way through batch operations as well. And there is some trickiness around batch operations. It's it kind of done, but not actually tested yet. Um, but it does all work and the generation comes off quite nice and cleanly. It's actually quite nice to read. We also pull validation annotations. So where there are, uh, something can't be null. Yeah, we mm -hmm. won't let mm -hmm. you submit it and make it null. So we don't even allow the SAP environment to error. We'll validate it client side, so we turn around and error to you quite quickly. Where we know about them anyway. Okay. Great. Great. Super. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me quickly switch gears. So if I share now, Martin, yeah? Yep. Yeah, it's coming up. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Can you try to Can zoom it? Yep. A little bit more. Slightly better. It's yeah, okay. Better. No, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, I can go one more to that. Okay, so this is the, the box that everything sits in. I'm not going to go through the components around what these are, but suffice to say, here's some generation code, and this is what is coming in, and it's reading our our output generation. So this is pluggable as well. 
you can see we're pulling which entity sets there are. Pulling in from ODA to EDN. Mm -hmm. So pulling in from the CSDL here, creating a model, applying a transform. So this is us actually applying the Oasis um, converter here. Mm -hmm. so we're using the one to bring this across from V2 to V4, so it's in a standard format. And then we've got a generator which is detailing the semantics of how this one actually gets gets created. This is all plugged. Yeah. So this was originally written for Kyoto, and we just had to implement a different IO data to SDK to implement the bespoke SDK. If you wanted something completely different, so for example, if you wanted to use auto rest, you could implement one here as well, and we'll publish all of this at a, at a later date. But next to the release of this to, to GitHub, um, we're also thinking about getting the, the famous deploy to Azure button onto the, the web page yeah? so that the generator runs for you, and but you really look only at the the generated classes. So the the conversion part um, or the, the the code generator part is not important to the developer in the end. Yeah? So the, the next step, deploy to, um, will, will be even more simplifying. Yeah? So in answer to, um, to the question earlier, these are the things which we're actually generating and writing. And you can see around entity sets, class footers, navigation properties, native properties, text fragment. Every, everything that we're having to generate in here is all abstracted away. And the, the primary purpose is to bring us from these templates that we can apply, which we can change, into the content of this folder here, which is generated yeah. out for each of our classes, which we yeah. There's some standard code here, which I'm not going to walk through because it's just used to build out and be referenced. We'll package those up into libraries. But as I say, this is a very, very sneak preview. But what you can see in here is our data GW sample basic library that gets generated contains a few things which are really nice to bootstrap. And it's the name of your data service. Huh? GW Sample Basic is the like the famous or data service example that all systems uh, contain. Huh? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if we look at the um, the project that's generated, it's a straight net six project. Yeah, it's reasonably dependency free. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of DI and setup options that come in, the configuration where we need them, and we're referencing these two projects which are further up here, which we'll distribute at mm -hmm. the moment them natively. If we look at what we see in here, so we've got a base DI setup, we've got all of the configuration options which are being registered. You don't need to care about any of this, you just care the call the extension method where you want to use it, which looks like this. I want to use a business partner and I want to use a product. I register these at startup and that's all I need to do. And this are the only Quick, quick into into there. This is the only thing that the developer starts doing now. Yeah, everything yeah. before and was introduction to to show okay. how com how complete it is. Yeah? yeah, but the only two lines that you started coding are eight and nine here. Yeah, everything else was done yeah. for you. Well, in fact, you don't even need to do that. This is part of the library. Yeah, mm -hmm. so all you need to do is to say in here, out the box, you'll get a list of these. You need to say which ones you want to expose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So don't by default expose all of them. So it generates them, and I've cut this down. But to use this, what you would see is this is standard um, dot net in, in I actually expose sales order set. OK, I haven't, I haven't generated the sales order set here, so that's why that's not showing. Only the sales order itself. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So let's jump in, let's focus on product for now, actually, because that's the, the crux of the demo mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. So again, we can see our product here um, is generating a static DTO for us with properties. And then we have some validation entries in here. This is all done out the box. So this is all done off your metadata. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see it needs to be less than 40 characters for a category. Name needs to be less than 255, and that's all off the back of our metadata. Yeah, again, developer doesn't need to care. This is all done for them. Mm -hmm. They just consume this. SAP already demanded this. Yeah? So the, the definition that we used was already telling us this is how it needs mm -hmm. to be. 
Yeah, so it takes away already the complexity there. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That's all coming out of the dollar metadata definition, basically, yes, of my OData mm -hmm. service. And that is yeah. now, this is now something that I just can use here in my project. And I don't need to look up what are actually the boundary conditions of the OData service. Or nope. is this a read only file? Is this nullable? Is this whatever? All of this is now presented to me here. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a developer, you should feel safe to be able to go and operate with these classes. Um, a number of we, we're also abstracting away a ton of the logic behind this into interfaces, but we don't really need to care about that right now in terms of what we're demonstrating. But the real meat of most of the logic is handled in this in these classes, mm -hmm. which are the OData operations based on entity sets here. So can I filter it? Can I um, mm -hmm. can I do a top? And those are the things which are embedded. We'll take a, we'll take a filter, and they're typed against a product, so they act on products lists. Yeah. Or maybe they act against a business partner. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then we can see down here as we mentioned the relations. So we can see our reference keys here. Mm -hmm. So we've got two orders, which is say yes. sales orders, contacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is now saying what's the key. So this is that relationship mapping. Mm -hmm. If I go to sales orders, what's the key for the sales order that I want mm -hmm. to query on? And there should somewhere be at the other end a get sales orders by business partner, which we can engage and call. So mm -hmm. wherever to sales orders is requested, we'll specify the value of the business partner ID of this business partner to fetch the related sales orders. And you can see here we have a special type which is not natively enabled in um, in .NET in general called a deferred enumerable. Yeah, which is wrapping the idea that we can actually have a, a lazily loaded filtered relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. You don't need to care about that as a coder. You, know, you just don't need to worry about it. It's just done. Yeah, it's part of the framework. And this is one of the reasons why we haven't just gone with the OData connected service. Mm -hmm. which we could try and port, go and find the port for that into .NET. There are some very subtle nuances in how SAP OData services work that we wanted to light up inside here natively. And we wanted to start with a prototype, uh, but at some point uh, we'll just uh, get that, that invested. Uh, we got very close to um, actually um, being too close to complete. Yeah, yeah like it's not that. far off. And yeah, it, so you, it actually works, right, from the metadata definitions. We haven't tested it with every scenario, but you know, it, you'll see that it does. It is actually quite elegant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we can see here we've got a nested type. So you can see this is it's come across in OData as a complex type. So CT address. And we've generated those as well. Mm -hmm. And these are first class objects. They also have validation and anything else sitting against these. So now let, let, let's run something, Will. We have seen a lot of uh, Parts of the things it's for the sake of completeness, yeah. So it's yeah. Um, it's it's not only one single example, but it's really the breadth of our data and what the service gives us. But now let's let's see some action. Yeah. Okay. So we've got two things that we can we can show for the developer centric um, model, and they're generated again off the back of this. So you can see here we actually have a test client sample here. So if you want to work with this. We've got functions, which we'll come to in a moment, but you can also work with the SDK natively. And if you want to see what the code is to simply go and get a product, yeah? Well, I need a product set, which is up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're injecting that up here. So there's some setup code here. This is all boilerplate. This all comes out the box. This is registered. Yeah, that's it. That's the setup. It's all you mm -hmm. need with the setting file. And then to consume it, we give you these templates, and if you want to go and get a, get a product, I'm going to move this off the bottom. Let's see what Copilot suggests. <laughs> Close. Wasn't quite. I mean, Copilot needs to learn. It does. Um, should, do you think it'll get it right next time? Oh, 
there you go. Get async. Bingo. So we're now teaching our AI how to how to retrieve SAP data. <laughs> but in this case, I think it was contextual. It was not yeah. taught, but it inferred from the, the last line. Yeah, exactly. No, indeed. Um, oh, look, it thinks we might want to go and fetch a business partner now. So you can see we have a BPS, and that's a business plan. So. Cool. Very okay. nice. And you, so you can see where we come from. I mean, the, the, the co-pilot piece is a little bit of, of fluff in the demo of what we wanted to do. Like, but <coughs> you get the point. It's inferred from a model, and the models are embedded here. Yes. So co-pilot yep. can see the model. And as a result, if the AI can figure it out, I'm sure a reasonably experienced or even relatively novice developer can figure yep. it out. Yeah, so, so we could do something a little more complex here. Mm. Yeah. So and, and you're absolutely right. I think this is much more intuitive. Instead of me struggling, maybe I don't even know what our data is, and I certainly oh. don't know what an SAP system is. And I, as the developer, I just want to retrieve. The business told me, look, create an app that um, lists the sales orders or something like that. So that's what I'm familiar with. I'm a developer, and now with this SDK, I have easy access to the, the the information. Obviously, I need somehow to get access to the SAP system, so someone needs to generate this for me. Yeah. Um, but then I'm encapsulated. I, I, I'm decoupled from, from the SAP developer. I can really work on this without needing to know a lot of stuff about OData or the exactly. SAP system. Yeah, and I think also, <clears throat> you know, you're talking about the complexity how to get the data, but there's also complexity how to back, uh, get this data back. Huh? So, and you in your SDK assume also converting this model back to to all data call back to the target system, yeah? and this is also one part mm -hmm. of complexity. Not just the first part to get the data is also how to save it, and you're covering exactly. both both those stuff, and it's yeah very good because. Dealing thank with you, all, the, all, the, all data semantics is not fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, because that's an amazing lead in. Yeah. <laughs> just, a, so just for the people on the audio, we didn't plan, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know Robert was going to say that, but my next component, yeah, which is again, let's try and bring Copilot into it as well, just for the sake. If we're going to do AI, mm -hmm. let's do AI. So get me sales order with ID, blah, 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 and update the customer name to test customer. Okay, now this is a risk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Okay, this must be so. Okay. Yeah, he's getting that. Okay. Retrieving the sales order. Yeah, okay. This is okay. So I don't have the sales order exposed in here. You remember I didn't generate SO? Ah, yes. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, and now, now the update. And save it. <laughs> oh, okay, update async. Cool. Great. So with the SDK, I mean, and obviously now we're we're playing a little with something that yeah. was not on the agenda, but um, uh, because of the SDK, um, because now um, the <laughs> models are created, even something like Copilot. Gets a better understanding of um, what needs to be passed. Um, what what are the functions available? What are the the, the classes available? Basically, hmm. and with yeah. this, Copilot can even help me here. Even though Copilot has no clue about our data in this specific context, doesn't have any clue about the SAP system, but it can help me um, develop these scenarios. Yeah. Cool. So. I want to look a little at the time also, um, and I know, I mean, we had this bigger Ignite block at the beginning, uh, which stalled us a little time, obviously, but um, wh where where are we now? Um, I think we, you are even, even though we cannot name any, any customers, I think you're even prototyping this already um, with a few customers as well. So this is not only a theoretical exercise, this is really something um, where customers are already benefiting from. Yeah, and there's spin-off activity around it as well. So, I mean, we're, we're hoping to bring one customer onto onto the the podcast shortly, who's who's not doing this with OData. Mm -hmm. They're doing something very similar with 
with um, soap interfaces. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start to bring HA and enterprise requirements into this, we're starting to see requirements for things like the circuit breaker pattern being applied. Mm -hmm. So all of these cross-cutting concerns, as we gather them, we can start to implement into the, into the libraries and we'll gradually start to take that customer feedback and bring it into a, mm -hmm. into a closed loop. I'm hoping we'll have something to show you at some point around that dual circuit breaker off service, service bus pack um, in the near future. But just to, just to wrap this up, I'd like to show the um, just a, a live function running. Mm -hmm. We talked about this function here. You saw this one on, on the um, the slide that Martin showed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And our live demo, I think the co-pilot one was probably reasonably impressive. But basically, this is as simple as it gets, right? We're binding the top parameter here. Actually, Can you zoom see. in again a little? Because it's a little hard to read. I mean, not, not yeah, here, especially. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. So here, yeah. what we're doing, we are calling um, top products one. Yep. So we're this calling is calling, the product. Mm -hmm. It's calling this. So we're scaling run products. Yep. And we're returning the SDK object mm -hmm. products top parameter that we specified, which was one, is getting injected into here, into this top factory. So effectively, that's going to fire an OData call for products to say, get me the top product. Awesome. Sorted by product ID, <coughs> where the product code is eight. Yeah, and I don't and need to care about the OData semantics here at all. And just to, to do a step back again, um, because I think th th there, there are so many things that you're showing at the moment. Um, you're yeah, doing this fair. via an Azure function. Uh, or I mean, yeah. you're, you're running this uh, locally, but potentially this would be something that you would deploy um, in an Azure function where you have the yes. all the SDK code here that you have auto generated. Yeah. And within this Azure function now, it's very easy for me, as you just shown, to develop something that would reach out to the SAP system yeah. via OData in the end. Um, although we know all the complicated complications that we have there. Yeah. Um, and then I could just have this this Azure functions that in this case retrieves the top product um, and yeah in your case it just displays the results here but this could also be something where we have a power app on top of that that calls this Azure functions to connect to the SAP yeah. system or mm -hmm. this could be a completely native app that is could developed. Be a web interface that calls the Azure function as part yes. of an API. Yeah absolutely cool. for a single page application. So we went a bit further than that which I didn't show. We did talk about this but this was going to be the next <clears> the next trick, but I'll quickly quickly go for this just because of time so we don't jump around as much. If we look in this folder here, what we don't really want to do is have to have people writing SAP bindings for functions. They're not that they're that complex to write, yeah, but they would also be based off the metadata that we generate. Because we've got the typed objects and we've got the sets, what we can do is we can generate all the code to have an Azure Functions binding object as well. And binding. So here what we can see is if you're familiar or not with other fun Azure functions, they work off bindings. You have a trigger binding, an input binding, and an output binding. Yeah, mm -hmm. trigger fires my function. We can't do mm -hmm. that. You could do it with event grid. Input binding provides information into my function, and output binding takes information from it. So here we've got an input binding for products, an input binding for sales orders, an input set for product set, so we can bind against that product set and run queries and a collector, which is an output binding for products and sales orders. So this extension for Azure Functions out the box allows any function that consumes it to read, write, change, nice. and query products mm -hmm. using the SDK library without having to care at all about even how that's implemented. So we generate a sample as well, which is this one. If we look at the SAP binding demo, this is what we were showing you earlier on. So this is this piece mm -hmm. where I've got an Azure function. This is running locally in my host, but yeah, I have an Azure function. Now Azure function is triggered by an HTTP GET, which is what so I can do it from a web browser yep. on a route of products with a parameter of top. And since we abstracted the binding, we bridged the gap to the developer ecosystem. The person who does this can be any functions developer, anyone yeah. who is familiar with, with this aspect, and he um, or her or whomever that is, um, doesn't have to deal anymore with, with the part that is SAP, SAP specific. Yeah. The only piece of code you now need to write 
Yeah. Now all the boilerplate's gone as well. Yeah. I can write that to be able to query SAP products in my platform, in my function. And the helpers, if I consume this, so you can see here I've got an object called product list. And there's a get list async that will bring stuff back for me. And I just specify some parameters and I can query the SAP service without, again, knowing anything about OData, right? So these are typed operators. So I don't need to know all the filter operators for, for whether they're starts with or equals or whatever. I can just do that and it will give me the list in IntelliSense. Yes, nice. Yeah. And yeah. actually, I mean, you, you just mentioned a very important point. I mean, obviously, I'm always looking from an SAP perspective, but this is all data that we are talking about. So, so if there's another um, system that um, exposes all data services where you might have similar challenges, the, 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 the story is still the very same. I mean, you could use yeah. this to connect to this specific all data service, and then you would have <coughs> all these abstractions um, to really stay in, you as the Azure Functions developer, stay in your environment, yeah. and um, connect to these data services. Exactly, yeah. So it's about opening up that ecosystem now into a wider context within functions. Yeah. The great thing about this though, when you generate this, I now have a function binding for SAP's GW sample service. Um, but I don't just have to consume that from C-sharp. I can load that and consume it from any function supported language. So it worked from Node.js, from Python, from all the other language yeah. constructs that I want. Um, and I'll just quickly show you a pretty fine version of the output because it's very familiar. Yeah. Well, we don't want to see PHP uh, bindings there, even though it's supported. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see the flames coming now for that one. Yeah, and then you can see that is it's nothing more than the standard OData output. Mm -hmm. We've maintained the deferred entries. Look, if you see if you see about halfway down, you can still see the relationship to sales or the line items. So we could we could then call back into that and go and follow that relationship, and if we did that, that would be calling two sales order line items on the on the returned object. So this gives me a list. In this case, I'm just rendering it as an output, but I could always do um, yeah. Let's do two. Yeah, let's do two business partners and get the business partner for that. Copilot just give me a little hand there as well. Yeah, but, but that that's really the, the really powerful thing from my point of view. So you, even here, you are guided by um, Copilot or Visual Studio Code, and not, not sure which did what now. Both. But even there, you're you're guided now in the development, and I think that's really the, this coming back to the, the to the piece that you that you initially said. Um, developers just want to have fun; they they want to build the application, and here they're they're guided in developing this specific application. They, they know I need here the um, city, um, the, uh, the the city of my address, basically, and the developers guide it towards this to, to easily retrieve the city information. Absolutely. Cool. Yep. So I think um, from, from my point of view, this, this is a fantastic overview. Um, what, what I would like to see in another episode, maybe we can really do a like like a, a tutorial or something like that. How how to do this from scratch from start? So that we say, look, this is our OData service. This is our G sample um, basic service in in the SAP system, OData. And of course, we maybe we start with an SAP Fiori user interface. Look, this is how it looks like. What SAP is doing or providing <coughs> out of the box. And now let's take this journey and make an Azure Functions out of this and 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 show the same thing how this this could be integrated in, in Azure Functions. So that we really show the step. This is your data service. This is what we do how this is how we generate the, the or how we use the SDK to generate the code. And this is a yeah similar like basically what you what you 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 showed already all the um behind the scenes stuff as well, but really show the the, the end user perspective in the end. Yeah. So, like last time, I think you, you made a perfect pitch for, for the next episode. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the last slide in the deck, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I think yeah, I think you know what, what what we discuss. We discuss about model. You, we discuss about controller because you implement also controller there. And what what uh, Holgas is suggesting? Where's the view? Yeah, where's the in in this model view controller? So is there maybe we can discuss later? Okay, is there any any plan to to do the binding on UI interface part? Because I have a model. If I have this I binding interface, then one step further to 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 be in very very simplified way of of doing from end to end. Yeah? So maybe this is a really topic for next time. Yeah? I love the idea. It's yeah. something that we we thought about, but we never actually got to. Probably more thinking about the resources it would take to implement yeah. that. Mm -hmm. is the, is the, the, the well, the good thing is we have lots of new ideas. So. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, we have the metadata, right? We could always build a yeah, exactly. Data as exactly. well. Just have an app built for you. Mm. It'd be, it would be more like using Power Apps at that point. Mm. Yeah. Now we can bring all of this together. Yeah. Version three three zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Good. <laughs> then exactly. Thank you so much for for providing this 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 overview of the of the new let's call it the Azure Function SDK for SAP. Um, we will definitely have you back on the show. And um, as you said, we, we, we might even have then some customers um, as well that talk about this implementation. I, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, thank Thanks. you everyone. Robert, have some more fun at Ignite and see you next Thank weekend. You. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.